The parasitic alien brood are back, threatening the X-Men and unveiling more of Jonathan Hickman's major cosmic plans for mutant kind. Today I'll answer, who are the brood and what's their relationship with the X-Men? How has Hickman been building toward these cosmic developments in the pages of New Mutants? And as far back as his post-War King's Fantastic Four, how is Jonathan Hickman using X-Men to integrate his own cosmic plans with Marvel's upcoming Empire event? I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. If you like the CBH YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Links to CBH channels and Patreon support are included in the show notes. You can find full X-Men and comic book reading orders on ComicBookHerald.com. Spoilers for discussed comics may follow. In X-Men number 8, writer Jonathan Hickman and fill-in artist Mamad Asra are returning to the swirling hard science fiction of Powers of Ten, full of Shi'ar graveyards, intergalactic bleed space evoking Warren Ellis's ergonaut poetry in The Authority, and rivers of dark matter inhabited by alien brood. As we've known since New Mutants number 1, written by Hickman with art by Rod Rice, Hickman's been planting seeds of brood narratives deep in our unconscious with the creation of the King Egg. And now with the OG New Mutants squad returning from their Hickman-written adventure among the Shi'ar and the Starjammers, they of course bring the menace of the brood back with them. Hickman's been quite locked into a devil-may-care attitude for all the New Mutants, leading Rain Sinclair here to declare the King Egg not more than her space booty. This is the point in time where that carefree spirit comes back to haunt Krakoa. With the brood arriving, because Rain Sinclair brought the King Egg back to Krakoa, the ever-expanding brood empire is set for a full-scale alien invasion. Although they've been decimated over the course of the previous decades, Hickman writes here that the brood are exponentially expanding, up to trillions of drones, thousands of conquered worlds, and 1,000 brood queens. For the less familiar, the brood are a menacing alien race the X-Men first encounter in earnest during a brood saga that runs from approximately Uncanny X-Men number 160 through number 167, with writing by Chris Claremont and art primarily by Paul Smith. In addition to vicious physical capabilities and a deceptively intelligent, merciless cunning, the nastiest thing about the brood is that they can infect their adversaries with brood eggs that will turn anyone into a part of the shared brood collective. In their first encounter with the X-Men, this is what the brood do to the team, putting the likes of Cyclops, Storm, Kitty Pride, and Colossus on borrowed time, until some last-second saving from the likes of Wolverine's healing factor, Carol Danvers' newfound binary powers, which are a result of brood experimentation, and that time Storm became a baby space whale for a little while. Adding insult to injury, when the Uncanny X-Men returned from their near-death experiences at the hands of the Brood, they returned to find Professor X, who had recently taken responsibility for the New Mutants at the X-Mansion, succumbing to full Brood Queen takeover. The Professor literally begs for death before the full transformation, but is instead casually cloned into a new walking body via Shi'ar technology by Mother McTaggart and Lalandra. I've been talking about this particular development since early House Powers because of the ways it might connect back to Big Picture Moira and Charles storylines, so pay careful attention here because I find it super fascinating. Speaking of which, in retrospect, the single most fascinating brood moment of the 2000s occurred in the Warren Ellis written Astonishing X-Men, a follow-up to the Joss Whedon and John Cassidy run that quite never quite lived up to its predecessor, but did introduce a brood-infected clone of Krakoa. This is something that's actually kind of hard to fathom given Krakoa's role in the post-House of X landscape, but could a brood still infect Krakoa? And what would that look like when all of mutant kind is living there? Like basically all of the known Marvel Cosmic players, shouts to my Kree Skrull listeners in the upcoming Empire event, the brood are nearly wiped out during the events of Annihilation and Annihilation Conquest. Abigail Brand, director of S.W.O.R.D., actually makes a case for the brood's role in the universe as parasitic predators, although it's worth pointing out she was half-infected by brood at the time. Nonetheless, I find this argument interesting. The brood as cosmic necessity, a la Galactus, rather than straight-up evil aliens who must be destroyed. Historically, there has also been evolving, dare I say, mutant brood, with a sense of compassion setting them apart from all brood kind. One of these is a member of Hulk's Warbound from Planet Hulk and World War Hulk, but the best of all of these is, of course, Brew, who was introduced in the pages of the Jason Aaron written Wolverine and the X-Men. Naturally, Brew is coincidentally visiting when the Brood invasion occurs all the way up here in X-Men number 8 in 2020, and he's quite perturbed to find a king egg just chilling like a decorative sculpture. Although Brew, who has most recently been seen working with Black Panther and the Agents of Wakanda, declares King Eggs disrupts the breeding cycle and makes the queens go to war, I'll admit I'm generally unclear about the specifics here. Brew knows of the King Egg, which is interesting, but have there been Brood Kings before? Perhaps during the Brood Invasion Jonathan Hickman teased in his own Shield Number 1 with Apocalypse as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. fending off a Brood Invasion in Egypt. Either way, the presence of the egg leads to a full-scale invasion of Krakoa in what is without question the heaviest attack on Sovereign Krakoa we've seen to date. Akanti space whales come crashing into the soil, and all mutants are almost instantly at war. 
Because Hickman has so many spinning plates in this issue, it's almost easy to overlook, but this is very much event-sized catastrophe and destruction in the home of the mutants. We'll get more of this in X-Men number 9, I'm sure, but there's some very cool fight choreography between Hickman and Asrar, particularly with Magic and Cyclops teaming up their power sets to unleash beams from all angles on the unsuspecting brute. Also, 10 out of 10 dialogue writing for Brew leading his mid-battle plan to save all mutants with a very polite, uh, excuse me? In the midst of all this brooding, there are two major developments happening. The first is an exploration of what actually happened to Gabriel Summers, a.k.a. Vulcan, the third, or fourth, for the Adam X heads, Summers' brother, at the end of Marvel's 2009 cosmic event, War of Kings. After a few years of storylines, including Rise and Fall of the Shi'ar Empire, in which Gabriel ascended to leader of the Shi'ar Empire, Vulcan led the Shi'ar to war against the Inhuman-led Kree. In the middle of War of Kings, the Vulcan vs. Black Bolt battle resulted in the explosion of a Terrigen T-bomb, the opening of a massive fault in the cosmos, and the apparent deaths of both Black Bolt and Vulcan. While Hickman readers know Black Bolt never died, as told in the pages of Hickman's Fantastic Four and FF, the mystery of Vulcan remained until Dawn of X. Importantly, in the updated Shi'ar battle record, Vulcan was not simply revived via Krakoa resurrection protocols. Instead, the update says that he simply never died. Vulcan's clearly dreaming of floating through the fault after his battle with Back Black Bolt, but it remains a mystery how he escaped, what he's been doing, and how the X-Men found him. Nonetheless, it's fascinating to see War of Kings so thoroughly reintegrated into Hickman's cosmic plan, in an amazing confluence of Vulcan, Black Bolt as the Celestial Messiah, and the recent New Mutants development that Zandra will step in as Empress of the Shi'ar. Gladiator has been Emperor since War of Kings. I'll save a true deep dive for another time, but it's also really interesting to me that Hickman's been using Celestial Messiah language to describe Black Bolt since his Fantastic Four and New Avengers days. This is hugely relevant for the upcoming Empire event, which the X-Men will tie into shortly, as Empire is going to connect heavily to the Avengers' Celestial Madonna saga. Suffice to say for now, I have some real questions about whether or not it was ever appropriate to label Black Bolt the Celestial Messiah, but again, my head hurts every time I try to talk Celestial Madonna or Messiah, so I'm going to save that deep dive for another time. Speaking of Empire, we also see Bobby DaCosta, aka Sunspot, making a deal with a Kree accuser, inhabiting Shi'ar space in order to collect the King Egg from the Starjammers, or so he had planned. Bobby effectively promises the egg to the Kree in order to free the Starjammers, despite his dislike for Corsair and company. Although the bigger reveal here is the presence of Kree in Shi'ar space, which clearly rings warning bells for the likes of Smasher, Gladiator, and even better, Kid Gladiator. Rapid fire predictions at the end of X-Men number 8 heading into the next issues, I think Vulcan's escape from the fault could well offer an additional mode of travel connecting back to powers of 10. There was a lot of work done there on interconnected black holes and galaxy brain sized space questions, and I'm really interested to see how Vulcan's story connects back to all of that. It's a small detail within this issue, but I also don't think it's happenstance that the genetic heir of Charles Xavier is currently being placed on the Shi'ar throne. I think it's part of Moira and Charlie's plan to establish a mutant empire in space. And finally, the King Egg is going to hatch in X-Men number 9, and it's going to upend everything we know about the Brood. I'm sensing a mutant brood alliance from here on out, in the vein of House of X number 5 overturning the traditional heroes vs. villains line on Krakoa. I think we're going to see something similar happen with the X-Men and the alien brood as we head into Empire. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Dave. You've been listening to Kraken Krakoa on the Comic Book Herald. If you have thoughts, theories, questions, shout out in the comments here on the YouTube channel. Of course, you can always find me at comicbookherald.com with more written analysis and reading order guides and at Comic Book Herald. Hey, if you're looking for reading orders for the X-Men, including the Dawn of X, check out the show notes here for the link. And of course, as always, you can go on over to comicbookherald.com and find just about everything you're looking for. So thanks again, everybody, for listening. And as always, enjoy the comics.